most of the things that drive people crazy, like dealing with insurance companies, are also true of Medicare. Hi, I'm Ted Balaker with Reason TV, and today I'll be sitting down with Virginia Pastrell. Pastrell is the author of two books, The Future and Its Enemies and The Substance of Style. She's former editor-in-chief of Reason Magazine and current editor-in-chief of DeepGlamour.net. You donated a kidney to an acquaintance of yours years ago, and in fact, Reason TV right. uh, covered that story. I think it's one of those issues that's very important but receives very little attention. Do you see, uh, since we, we broadcast that piece a couple of years ago, have there been any promising developments on the organ markets front? There hasn't been much on the organ markets front because anything that requires a change in government policy is extremely difficult. The most promising area in terms of actually getting people kidneys who need, need them are these very complex barter arrangements where people do chain donations. If you have one altruistic donor, uh, who says, you know, I'll give my kidney to whoever needs it, you can essentially create an indefinitely long chain uh, as long as there's a measure of trust, which it turns out there is a surprisingly large one. When I was editing Reason, I published the occasional article on this, but it was sort of like, yeah, 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 I'm a libertarian, they should do this, it's bad, you know, you own your body. It was only when I was touched by it myself, when my friend Sally Sattel needed a kidney, that I, came to realize what a huge problem it is. And, um, you know, policy and apathy and sort of ignorance and also this sort of repulsion and people's ignorance about what is actually involved in donating a kidney in 2010 as opposed to, you know, 1970 uh, is, is keeping th this from happening. About a year ago, you wrote an article called My Drug Problem uh, for the Atlantic Monthly. Uh, it was very controversial. Um, can you talk about uh, the main point you made in the article and why readers responded so strongly to it? I was incredibly healthy, right? I was so healthy I could donate a kidney in 2006. In 2007, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I was diagnosed with a particularly aggressive form of breast cancer, which is called HER2 positive and for which there is what can only be called a miracle drug called Herceptin. The existence of Herceptin uh, cut my chances of dying from this disease from 50-50 down to maybe 5%, if that much. And I'm now apparently cancer-free. But it's expensive. My treatment, which was the standard uh, treatment, cost about $60,000. and most developed countries cover Herceptin because it is so effective, but I discovered in the course of researching what I thought was going to be an article on something else, uh, that New Zealand, which is the uh, exemplar of rational drug price controls and, and you know having one of these boards that really puts the screws to the drug companies and was not, had not covered Herceptin for people like me who were early stage cancer patients. And I wrote about this dilemma uh, of when you have these very expensive biotechnology uh, cancer drugs, what happens when you have essentially a single payer system and somebody has to decide bureaucratically whether it gets treated or not. And um, what happens is essentially becomes a politicized process. And talk it, about that a bit. It, I mean, that's that's something that Americans um, would be amazed at and frightened about. It was this miracle drug was actually an election issue. How, yeah, it was how an election so? issue because the uh, the national health system would not pay for it. You could get it if you could pay for it yourself, and then they changed and they said, "Well, we'll give you just a few." rounds of it because there is this small study, this Finnish study that says that you don't really need that much. And women in New Zealand, breast cancer uh, uh, patients and uh, their sympathizers and their doctors uh, made it a political issue. The idea that you can have kind of objective science weighing people's trade-offs about whether the co about cost benefits is false. You can have objective science that tells you 
what's the percentage chance that this is going to work and what types of patients, that sort of thing. But, you know, is it worth another dollar? Is it worth $60,000? Well, what if it were $70,000? What if it were $30,000? That sort of trade-off uh, is very difficult to make at uh, you know, one size fits all level. What do you say to those who say the big picture trade-off is one between innovation and equity? And so that maybe in a universal system, you wouldn't have had as uh, good access to Herceptin, but more people would have been covered and more lives would have been saved. Well, there's a lot in there. <laughs> what do you mean by a universal system? Uh, are you concerned about equity in the sense of like everybody should be the same or are you concerned about a safety net? Those are two different things. Uh, so for example, in the, in the national health system in, in the UK, it is designed to make sure everybody is treated the same. And the argument is we don't want p two people next to each other in beds in national health, uh, health system where one is getting treated and one why and another is another. That's a different view of equity from what I think most Americans are thinking of, which is a safety net. Uh, so there's, what do you mean by equity? There's what do you mean by a universal system? Um, and, and what do you mean by cancer treatment? And what because do you mean by radiation cancer treatment? Is radiation therapy oh, is radiation expensive. Maybe is, receptin on, I don't know, maybe on balance it's cheaper. In some way. Well, they're compliments, but radiation, one thing I learned as a cancer, radiation is unbelievably expensive. And the, the thing is, though, when you're getting radiation treatment, you see why it's expensive because the machines are obviously incredibly expensive, really complex machines, and they're very delicate. They have, and, the, and all the people working on them, there's this whole team, and they're all really highly trained. You know, I think our system is really screwed up. It's really screwed up because it ties health insurance to employment. Uh, there's that's an artifact of you know, wage and price controls during World War II. And what happens is at the very time that you need insurance, if you lose your job, you're screwed. So the question is really what happens when you become uninsurable? That's, or or, or when, when we know that you have diabetes, or we know that you have a car, heart condition, or we know that I had breast cancer. Now my now, my oncologist says that I have no more chance of getting breast cancer again than a similarly situated person who didn't have breast cancer, but I doubt that I'm going to convince an insurance company that. Talk a little bit about your uh, personal experience in dealing with navigating the world of insurance after you survived <laughs> breast cancer. The most interesting thing that happened to me dealing with insurance when I had breast cancer had to do with getting a wig. Now. The only reason my insurance covered a wig, I'm sure, is that the state of California requires it to. And the truth is, I could have bought my own damn wig. Uh, you know, they, uh, an expensive wig costs a few hundred dollars, uh, you know, and there are cheap ones. And I never even wore my wig except for three times, one of which was on Reason TV. Uh, I just wore scarves and hats. Um, but because the state you know, because it was in my insurance that they covered a wig, I went out, I spent more money on wigs, I bought two. I, I spent more money on wigs than I would have spent if the insurance hadn't covered it. And then I spent months fighting with the insurance company to get them to code, put the right little code in there so that they would pay this little shop where I bought the wigs. It was a nightmare. And of course, when you're having cancer treatments, you just don't want to deal with insurance companies. You know, one thing I, I would point out, one of my big um, litanies during the healthcare debate is Medicare first. Because most of the things that are so screwy about this American system in general, most of the things that drive people crazy, like dealing with insurance companies, are also true of Medicare. Medicare has a million forms. Where do you think all these like DRG numbers come from? <laughs>